Hey guys, so most people when they travel, you know, even though they won't admit it, they want to come up with some sort of epiphany. And the only epiphany that I've received is, is, a, is a history lesson. Primarily that the world has not yet recovered from post-World War II uh, fallout um, and restructuring. And, you know, if you, if you want to look at um, a very simple example of how all that works out, uh, I'm sitting nearby the Indonesian National Monument in Jakarta. And it looks exactly like the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. And so I don't need to know, I don't need to open a book anymore to realize that that was built after uh, 1945. And the reason that it looks the same, and it's not just this country, it's, it's worldwide. If you go to the Dominican Republic, I believe the governor's mansion um, or the mayor's mansion in Santo Domingo is almost an exact replica of the White House in Washington, D.C. So, you, so how did all that come to be? And it all came to be because of a man called Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower, a minority. His mother was a Jehovah's Witness. And this minority, American, uh, was mentored by possibly the greatest diplomat in American history, George Marshall. And that's where you have the Marshall Plan, where you have uh, America giving foreign aid through trade agreements and other means in order to build up countries that were destroyed post-World War II. So because of these two men, uh, it is not a coincidence that Japan and Germany are now two of the most successful countries in the whole world. So this alliance between the greatest diplomat and the greatest military general lasted all the way through, possibly from what I can you know, guess, the election of George, w is George Bush, the father, not the son. And suddenly what happened was at that, by that time, the Soviet Union had collapsed. And what George Bush decided to do, a man from Texas, headquarters of ExxonMobil, what he decided to do was he decided to create a new world order. In one of his speeches, he uses that term, NWO. So the problem is, when you, instead, of, instead of having a diplomat mentoring him, he might have oil companies mentoring him in order to promote economic growth. And that actually is... It's, now, keep in mind... His vision succeeded. Today, ExxonMobil is a, a multi-billion dollar company, and America is now exporting, uh, I think, I believe it's the number one oil exporter in the world, primarily, if, if I'm guessing again, uh, to developing countries. And this is really interesting, right? Because, you know, we in developed countries are trying to move away from oil. And so in order for their system to continue, um, you know, we have to sort of export, developed countries have to export to developing countries, uh, which is going to be a very strange and interesting process to, uh, because from what I hear, if you go to Shanghai, a lot of that energy uh, that runs the city is, is, you know, new, it's renewables. And so we're going to have a very interesting time in the next 15 years, 20 years to see whether or not Exxon and all these other companies that create so many jobs in America uh, including in the Midwest and the South, where it's difficult to create jobs, um, you know, in, in many cases because of the lack of technology transfer. Um, so you've, you've got a lot of, you know, in, in other words, there is no technology hub in the Midwest um, or, you know, in the South except for Austin, uh, even though it's got a huge, huge amount of land and population as well. And so you've, you're looking at a system where you've got these competing economies, the old economy, which is based on oil, and George Bush's vision of a new world order that's based on secure oil supplies um, in, in the collapse of the Soviet Union, which again is one of the world's top, you know, um, you know, or was one of the world's top exporters, and now it continues to be, especially with natural gas. And the reason that, that the first Bush would would pursue this strategy of securing oil supplies is because of you know 1979 and because of what happened to Jimmy Carter. And these guys who are still there in the military establishment, that's what they grew up on. They grew up on OPEC uh, deciding to boycott after the Six-Day War and, and oil prices going through the roof, long lines in American um, you know, suburbs trying to you know, pump their cars full of whatever gas was remaining. And so that's what they grew up on. And so they succeeded in their vision, which unfortunately is a vision that didn't keep up with technology. And the younger generation... We are all about the, the digital, and um, and apologies for calling myself young, I'm 40, uh, and so ultimately we're in a position now uh, where we're trying to compete where the people, political players 
are not diplomats anymore. They're lawyers, but they're certainly not diplomats. They're, you know, ex-CIA directors like the first Bush. And again, no diplomatic skills whatsoever. Now, or they're actors like Ronald Reagan, uh, which would make sense in the age of the television, uh, where in many cases the president has become a figurehead for all these other forces that are seeking to reshape the world in their own image. Now, as this has happened, you know, what's, what's really happening now is that China now controls the majority of the top 10 ports in the world. And I'm in ASEAN. I'm in, I'm in a country that's part of a new economic alliance. It's not new. I apologize. It was created uh, quite some time ago, but it's becoming, for the first time, um, you know, it's becoming effective for the first time. For the first time, I'm saying, I've been traveling for quite some time. For the first time, I'm saying separate lines for ASEAN, which means that all these sort of military alliances are now um, trickling down to the civilian population, which is a sign that things are working. And so, and in fact, there's going to be another summit uh, that China will be involved in, uh, an economic summit that will further move people away from, countries away from this old economy, um, you know, George Bush imposed that dynamic. Um, and we've got a long way to go. I mean, last night I was at the Asian Games, and you see these sort of like massive tank-like structures. Um, they're not tanks, but you can drive them in civilian streets. Um, and ultimately, apparently, the engine was made by Germany. The outside of it was made by Korea, South Korea, and the tires are American, Michelin. So you see that, you know, it's not just in America that people are trying to spread the military budget um, or spending. The uh, military spending through appropriations is now, you know, is, since 9-11 has exploded. And appropriations are much less accountable. And so what's really happened is not only, you know, this new NWO under a system where George Bush wanted to impose his ideas on the world, um, you know, which was really an idea is based on frustration with the current order of being dependent on OPEC. But in doing so, you know, these guys are not technocrats. I mean, sorry, they're not technology people. That he couldn't have foreseen the future. So their entire political strategy was, was in retrospect, a failure, even though it succeeded because the world is moving away from oil. It's moving towards natural gas. In my city, uh, most of the government uh, vehicles are, are running on natural gas. Now, what's the problem with that? Russia and Iran are the top you know, reserves in that commodity. So we're looking at a future where post-World War II, Eisenhower, who was mentored by Marshall, imposed his will on the rest of the world without ever calling it a new world order, even though it was. And thankfully so. This minority changed the world in ways that we can still have him to thank for, especially if you're in Germany, especially if you are in Japan, or even Singapore, or Taiwan. I mean, the the list is endless. Suddenly we fast forward, and we have an NWO that's trying to be created by someone that doesn't have much diplomatic skills, that is really skilled in propaganda and oil, and we see the result. So, a study in contrasts, uh, America will still have Singapore as its main ally in ASEAN. The question is whether it'll have anyone else. And the reason Singapore is so, is so important is because um, the U.S. is, you know, the naval power is still number one in the world. It controls trade, and 90% of trade still operates uh, through shipping. Uh, and as a result, you know, the United States you know, dollar is still huge. And one of the reasons that the United States uh, is controls shipping is to, sh- to ship oil, and not just to ship it, but to refine it. So in, Indonesia actually has a lot of oil. Um, you know, it's got a lot of everything, actually, uh, which is why I'm so optimistic about this country. Uh, gold, mineral, and gas, and Papua, everything. And so the question is, you know, why haven't they been able to maximize that value? And it's because the Navy is dependent on U.S. the U.S. Navy, which controls many ports all over the world, including Singapore. It doesn't. It's, 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 Singapore is a sovereign nation, but uh, the United States, of course, is, it's the number one ally of the United States in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and so is India, right? India and so on, and, and, and Singapore. Um, and so the question is, if, if we move away from a you know, physical economy to a digital economy, what will, these, what will all these investments in the Navy protect? Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a good question to ask you know, for anyone who wants to consider politics moving forward. Um, so that's really it. Um, you know, hopefully we can try to all figure this out because you know, China has stepped into, into any void the U.S. has left behind. Uh, whether it's the failure to pivot to Asia, uh, the consequences of which we see now, where the only real ally in um, ASEAN, uh, you know, continues to, in that area, continues to be, um, you know, I'm not even going to say Australia, because if you look at how dependent they are on the Chinese purchases, 
uh, you've got another issue um, coming up in that respect. But what's really the other um, final point is that the reason that we, we feel that the, the diplomacy is not working anymore is because it's not. And the reason for that is because the UN has not adapted to a new, to the real NWO, which is that China is, n is not given a proper seat at the table. And, you know, it's not, it, it, its influence within those structures is not commensurate with its real world influence and power. And so it's going to operate outside of those structures. And when you have the biggest guy in the room operating outside of normal, of your established the diplomatic channels, um, there's going to be a massive disconnect. And Gordon Brown, uh, Prime Minister of the UK, pointed that out. He said, you know, you got all these tax structures and we can't make any sense of these things because if we lower taxes, somebody else will lower it even more. Uh, we have to have a global cooper cooperative network to make sure we don't have things like the Panama Papers um, or other means of avoiding uh, of tax avoidance, which make it difficult for governments, to, especially in democracies, to have credibility. And so this is the future. Uh, the future is whether or not the UN is going to incorporate China meaningfully, as well as India, um, you know, and a lot of other countries. Is it, it going to change? Uh, and if it doesn't, what is the future of diplomacy?